Davis Lear, I think we're live. Right, okay. Yeah. So yeah, um I, I won't even I won't even admit to the crowd about um the the little mishap that I that I just went through there. So how you doing, man? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you now. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. No. So, so catch me up on uh, what's going on in uh, sunny California. Oh, the weather here has been kind of hectic. It was seventy-one, and now it's eighty-four today. That's California. It is, I live in Palmdale of the Los Angeles County, so I'm in the high desert. I'm at like three thousand feet a year. So we get extremely hot, extremely cold. So you are you're under lockdown then? Yeah, so they say. But I mean, uh, you know, I, I specialize in exempt protection work. And, uh, I'll be out in Malibu tonight working with okay. maybe property. So I stay I stay busy at seventy three years of age, still active. You know, not to slow down. Just here to die. Right. <laughs> um. So, so yeah, you know, one of the pictures that I use for you is, um, I think, I guess it must be from your years. You were in the sheriff's department, was it? Uh, that's right. Yeah, I patrolled to uh, 68 years of age. Okay. Um, now, refresh my memory. Is that how you got associated with JKD, like through Bastillo or something? I'm trying to remember. <laughs> The way I found out about uh, the Philadelphia College Academy was, uh, you know, 1973, I sustained a very serious accident. I broke my house on fire, tried to save somebody's life, and almost lost my right hand. Uh, this was before I became a police officer. Well, I was laid up for a year. And, you know, I've been in martial arts since 1966, Taekwondo, uh, Kajin Kempo, and Judo. And uh, okay. I to, so I happened to buy an Inside Kung Fu magazine, volume number two, and uh, it was an article about Danny and Tom. I got to reading, they gave a picture of location, so I went by that, that same day, and I met the man, Danny and his son. Uh, I told him I was handicapped, partially, temporarily, I didn't know if it was going to be permanent, and uh, he said, don't worry about it, you just do whatever you think you can do. Well, that was my first step in the JKZ. Uh, right. do whatever you think you can do. Yeah. And that's where it started back in 1974. Okay. <clears throat> hey, wait, hang on a second. Um, um, the, the, the other, the ex, you see, you see, you have an external speaker set up too, right? Yeah, I'm talking on the external speaker. Um, okay, because, because I'm hearing, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo, but I'm not sure if it's, if it's that or not. I don't think it's like Okay. Um, yeah, there's some there's something that's given that's given us feedback. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. How is that? That sounds better, I think. Yeah, turn that one off. Because you know, this is a this is a high quality production. So yeah. <laughs> okay, how do you hear me now? Okay, yeah, I think that's better. I think that's much better. So, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, let me see here. Do you? Okay. How do you hear me now? Yeah, I'm good. You hear me all right? Yeah, my AirPods aren't working on the iPad for some unknown reason. So are you hearing me through the iPad, but not through the yeah, ears? Yeah, I'm hearing you directly through the iPad. Okay, all right. Well, that, that might, uh, that, I mean, so, sometimes sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it isn't, so. Um, all right, so tell me that again. Hey, a guy named Cameron Rico just came on. Oh, did he? Yeah, he just came on. I'm I'm keeping my I'm keeping my eye on who's joining because I'm expecting some uh, some high profile guests. <laughs> oh really? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, 
you know, when I mean, when they heard when they heard that JKD JKD uh, celebrity was coming on, you know, some of the other JKD celebrities just might show up. And they probably want to see if I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and before, before, um, before we get too far, um, I don't think he'll be able to make it live, but um, Bert Richardson asked me to say hello on his behalf. Ah, great guy. Yeah, great guy. I've known Richard since he was a young kid when he first started at the college academy. All them kids, man. Yeah, well, everybody's a kid to me except Danny and Asano. <laughs> 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 I, mean, I started, I was 28 years of age and Dan was 38. Right. And Richard Bastillo was six years older than me and Jerry Pote was about, about the same. So what kind of shape were those guys in back then? Pardon me? What kind of shape were those guys in? Oh, guys. Like Danny Anasano, Jerry Pote, uh, Richard Bastillo, tip-top fighting shape. I mean, just remarkable. Dan, to give you an example, training with Dan was like training under a martial arts encyclopedia. The man would start off his curriculum was just unknown. Uh, Jerry Pote was my actual first instructor. He carried me through all three phases, but Dan would take the second half of the class. So okay. Jerry, what, we, what, what we had, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about what's original JKD, what's the concept. Well, right. basically, the original JKD is those from Chinatown, period. Hey. The I'm going to put this up because I couldn't get it onto the computer in time. Yeah, that's me. But just Jerry. so everybody. And that's Jerry's wife. That was right. taken at the first uh, Bruce Lee dinner. Okay. Oh, yeah. was that the Jeet Kune Do Society? Uh, it was it that group? It, 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 I don't think it was uh, that we, when I was in the Jeet Kune Do Society when they had it, I don't think it was that. It, it could have been that, maybe, you know, you'd have to ask Chris Kemp, but that probably was, uh, we probably put it on. And it was okay. in the city of Gardena. You know, very, I, everybody popped up. I mean, people from, uh, Ed Parker was there right before he died. And yeah, he, wow. Yeah, he passed away, oh gosh, five days after that affair. I think it was. Wow. we some of the top name martial artists that you've known for since the '60s was at right. the, it, was, it was fantastic, really great, a fantastic night. But out of that, right. the, the, the instructors I had, I mean, I actually I physically boxed Jerry Pote, not, not Jerry, but Richard Bastillo. Uh, the first time Dan did a pox foul on me as a demonstration, he dislocated my right shoulder for three weeks. I couldn't use it. I mean, it's hard to believe how much strength. He could yeah. just box out. Richard Bastillo, uh, excellent boxer. I boxed him, but luckily I didn't get hit because I was able mm -hmm. to get out of his way. Jerry, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, you would do chi saw with him or whatever, any of the hand techniques, and he would burn you out in seconds. And the man had a bad back, but he could do things that was just uh, unremarkable. Yeah. But he always told me, uh, po Jerry Pote said, Dave, always master the basics they will never fail you which is true All right yeah for sure um you could tell me again about the injury was it to your right hand or your left hand yeah my right hand. what happened I, I hit a window trying to they said there was a, a child inside i saved the dog really what it was <laughs> yeah i cut my wrist took about 183 stitches okay and you know the doctor said i would never use his hand again well when you train with Danny Anasano, things happen. And uh, you could ask Chris, it was kind of funny. I could not twirl a collie stick that would fly across the room because I couldn't hold on to it. Mm -hmm. You know, once mm -hmm. I, I had no grip. My grip was at about 1%. Well, Dan told me to hold a stick and just hold it out to my side, hold it in the middle, and just twirl it. But what it did, it built my forearm back. Now, I couldn't box for a whole year. I did box left-handed. and. Right. One night, I was in class, and um, Jerry was teaching, and all of a sudden, my right hand came back. I mean, I got shocks going through nerves. It was like somebody just plugged me into the wall. And I, I'm a natural southpaw. And really? after that, you know, my right hand came back. My jab came back. My it, jab just, it just came back, like, all of a sudden? 
a miracle. Wow. Uh, and when my jab came back, uh, it was, uh, I was able to work it more and more and more. The jab is the key to fighting, you know, so I always emphasize the jab. And okay. it, got, it got to the point that, uh, gosh, it came back. It came back better than what it ever was. <laughs> I mean, even to this day, I don't have 100% feeling. I have about 85% of feeling in my hand. And but back then in 74, 75, I could actually take a needle and stick it anywhere in my hand and I wouldn't feel it. I had no uh, feeling. So when I'm uh, hitting, the way I could judge how hard I was hitting was how far I would snap your head back. <laughs> 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 you know, and that, that was it. Yeah. But, you know, the training, Dan and, and Bastillo and Jerry Pote, who was my idol, I mean, um, it. I trained with the Korean Rock Marines in Vietnam. They're superheroes, excellent martial artists. I mean, these guys are, are good. They're probably their own style of JKD, but it wasn't called that, of course. But these right. guys are versatile in jujitsu, uh, karate, boxing, wrestling, uh, fighting with a knife. They were, they were killers. They, they were good. Yeah. Blue yeah. Yeah. I went through that. Yeah, I made all the belts and all. And, and, I, I did what I wanted. I didn't go any further into Taekwondo because I wanted more. And uh, I had the opportunity to move, meet Bruce Lee in 68. I went to a party instead and didn't do it. <laughs> you know, I, 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 <laughs> but hey, man, this guy, Bruce Lee is here in Taiwan. Let's go meet him. Man, man I don't want to be. Man, I want to party before I go to Vietnam. I've only got, what, three more weeks. <laughs> I went out. And, and, you know, we got, you know, drank and had fun, you know. But yeah. uh, I didn't get to meet Bruce. The only, the closest I got to meeting Bruce Lee was before he passed away. Brandon Lee uh, trained in my class at the Merida Academy. And right. training Brandon was like, wow, here I'm training Bruce Lee's son. And this guy, you could show him something. And in seconds, he could do it perfectly. You know, just remarkable. Yeah, mm -hmm. he was a lot of fun, very, very, you know, cocky, very comical, just mm. a, a nice kid, you know, yeah. but uh, he said, yeah, Dave, what you showed me, I'm going to use my next movie. Uh, I don't know what movie he did it, but I guess it was a shin kick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know exactly what movie it was, yeah. right? It was, yeah, it was in rapid fire because he shin kicks a guy, he shin kicks a guy that's coming down the stairs or something. And he kicks through the railing of the stairs to nail the guy. So that's exactly what movie it was. Yeah, the way I taught him the technique, I had, I had him and his partner. You have to hold hands, you know, at the top like this. And you're holding hands and you try to kick each other. It's a drill Danny, Danny and Asano gave us. And uh -huh. uh, in that drill, he liked it. No, I can use this for movies. You know, okay. <laughs> I'm not a movie star, but do whatever you want to do, you know. That, that's classic. Really good kid. Yeah, you know, I think um, I'm wondering now if because I partnered him in a class at the Inasano Academy one time. I'm yeah. wondering if it was your class because I know I, I you I don't remember if you and I ever talked about this, but one time you called. I was in L.A. and you called because you could not make it to class, so I answered the phone. Right, happy than me. <laughs> <laughs> I ended. No, I ended up in your class. Yeah, I used to train at the college academy about three or four days a week. And so mm -hmm. that, I mean, that just, I, I've always loved Martin. I still, I, you know, I don't train. I'm not affiliated with any schools anymore. My mm -hmm. garage, I have all my equipment in my garage. I work with my, two of my kids are in law, getting law enforcement. One is, and my daughter's getting ready to. So okay. I, I teach them. Um, you know, when I was active, I, uh, I, I coached the sheriff boxing team for four years. And, uh, I've taught defensive tactics to a couple of sergeants, lieutenants that had contracts on their head from the Mexican mafia. And mm -hmm. in the in custody, I was teaching them how not to get stabbed, what to do in situations. So I love what I do. I'm an open book. You know, I, I, whoever wants the knowledge that they ask me, if they're sincere, I'll give it to them. Yeah. If they're stuck on egos, I'm not going to bother. <laughs> I, I mean, I've had I've had guys that couldn't fight. I had a guy that had uh, arthritis his whole body, and I taught him how to defend. He was 63 years of age. He said, mm -hmm. I don't know. And I told him, I said, look, when I started, I was handicapped. 
I right. said, so I'm not going to say you cannot work out. Right. Say, do what you can do. That's my motto. Do whatever it is you can do. Because, you know, you know right. in martial arts, you know, it's in JKD, everybody said, what is, what is JKD? You know, basically, you modify yourself every moment mm-hmm. of the day. If you get into a fight, what do you do? You adjust because you mm-hmm. can't fight the same. With, I cannot fight at you how I fight a 300 pound Samoan. Right. I still, you know, so you have to adjust. And that's what it's all about. You know, like, I know you talked about curriculum. Our curriculum was basically the basics. And mm-hmm. you get to, that's your foundation, your basics, how to mm-hmm. kick, how to punch, using the tools. And then you get an application. And then the third phase, you're getting more into perfection. What was so unique about the guys I trained with, even like I'll, I'll use Chris Kent as an example. Mm-hmm. We would, I was learning a lot of Chi Ch- South with Jerry Poti and Chris Kent. And Chris would always say, Dave, your right hand is not the same as your left hand. I said, that's because I can't feel you. <laughs> I have no sense of the right hand. But Chris, Chris is a very patient person. I think he's a, uh, I don't call Chris an instructor. I call him a professor. Because of a, yeah. a professor is like when you go to become a doctor, you learn yeah. from a professor and then you adapt your own after you graduate. So Chris is a perfection, professor what he does. Yeah. Uh, I highly respect Chris as long as I don't have to help him move pianos up the stairs. <laughs> but a very extremely knowledgeable person. I mean, when I used to box Chris, he would say, hey, Dave, man, you're, you're like my friggin' shadow. Well, we both had good jabs, and we would we would spar for three minutes and never hit each other, because we uh-huh. felt so identical, like fighting your mirror. Now, the guy that was the beast was my partner, Steve Martinez, that you know. And when I yes. would box Steve, it was, uh, we nobody wanted to box us, and we would just go, we, we'd just see how much could we take. And we may go five rounds a night, and we would just pound it out. And then uh, on that picture that you had, there's a Samoan guy named Hector Reed. He was another powerhouse. And if you get hit, mm-hmm. you your chest. But what was so unique about this group of guys is that when we train, if you can hit me, I would ask you, how did you get me? If I hit you, you would say, hey, how did you get me with your jab? We would self-train each other and pass knowledge back and forth. And that, oh, I see. That was so unique. I don't know about anybody else's JKD after me, but I can tell you, the Philippine College Academy, we were a family. You know, we we strive to make everybody better. When I met Chris Kent, I think Chris was probably 19 years of age, and I was 38. I was 20. I was 28. And then Jeff Amata, Jeff Amata was just a little hair over 21. You know, so everybody yeah. was just Steve Martinez right. younger than me. Now, that guy next to Chris Kent, that's Greg Shannon, a uh, powerful kicker, super powerful. I think he had a uh, tank sudo background. Uh, okay. Now, the Japanese guy next to Steve Martinez, that's Ted Watanabe, very unorthodox, but don't underestimate him. And then next to Jerry Poti, that's Joe Poe, uh, a samurai type of guy. But if you box him, you never knew where his punch was coming from. This guy, he, you'd think he was clowning around with you, but he could just leap out of nowhere, and then here comes a punch. You know, mm-hmm. he was very tricky, very sneaky, but all these guys were unique in, in themselves. You know, everyone, and this, great guys, you know, great guys to train with. I mean, if I if I was still, I mean, I, I don't box anymore because I've had yeah. eye So the doctor says, I'm done with box, box the doc. I'm 73 years of age. I don't have nothing else to prove. But yeah. so what I do, I pass on my knowledge. I mean, I've worked with a right. lot of good people in law enforcement, mainly law enforcement, because uh, people off the streets, I don't know who I'm training. And I don't want to give this great knowledge to somebody that's going to use it the wrong way. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you were to send me somebody, Dave, this friend of mine is going to be in town for two weeks. Could you work with them? Yeah, not a problem. You know, I love taking right. people that have had martial arts but are not good fighters and I've had I've met guys that that Dan has had seminars with, and they they came to the Marina Academy and they said, you know, I'm a full instructor, but I don't have good fighting skills. I said, it's not a problem. Don't worry about it. Show me what you got, yeah. and I teach them 
how to develop themselves. You yeah. don't have to know the encyclopedia. If you know three, four, five good things, you're going to survive. Yeah. And yeah, they came from France and, and Germany, you know. But Man, then, at that time, there were people from all over, huh? I remember. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Dan, I cannot, probably the only place Dan hasn't been is maybe Red China, <laughs> you know, <laughs> country. I know yeah. Dan, years ago, Dan said he wouldn't go to the Philippines because uh, he didn't know how they would take him in Cebu, you know, being his Filipino stylist also, you know. Mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I, I've never been to Dan's seminars because I have a seminar every time I train with Dan. Right. You know? Yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Yeah. I, I, I didn't want to be greedy. Uh, let, let, let all these guys that don't get this exposure, let them have some of Dan. I mean, mm -hmm. I had 10 years with Dan straight, you know, and I said, you know, I'm, I don't need to be greedy. Plus, I couldn't mm -hmm. do it so job wise. I couldn't. I couldn't take off and uh, you know, I'm teaching or I'm training, you know, but yeah. uh, it, it, was, it was great. Hey, let me ask you. Let me ask you this. Um, so Cameron uh, says that Greg Shannon's nickname was the Dancing Bear, right? Yeah. Yep. But but Bob, um, I'm going to mess up Bob's last name. But Bob uh, uh, Dubla Janine in Germany says hello, Lapu Lapu, and I seem to remember that <laughs> Lapu Lapu was your nickname. That's me. Yeah. Right? I got that name. We were doing a show. And there was this, this this Filipino master named Jack Santos came up uh -huh. to Dan and says, why is it you don't have no Filipino boys doing this? And Dan, I'm standing next to Dan, and says, oh, this is Dave Lapu Lapu. And, <laughs> and, you know, Dan just, he said it, and the guy, oh, and, you know, he had a cigar in the middle of his mouth. And uh -huh. the name stuck with me. So everybody called, they call me Lapu Lapu more than they call me Dave Lear. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it, just, it just stuck with me. I said, oh, well, okay. Yeah. But, but hey, um, go, go back go back a, a few to the Kali Academy. So you trained um, primarily in Jerry Poteet's class. And then you said Sifu and Asano would come in and teach the end of the class. The end of the class was the Filipino martial art section? No. no. Uh, oh, Jerry, okay. What Jerry Poteet told me one time, he said, I said, Jerry, how do you learn all this stuff? He says, don't tell anybody, but Dan takes me outside and tells me what to teach you, which curriculum to teach you guys. So Jerry would do the basic, the warm up. Let's say if it's a, if it's an hour class or an hour, and a half. the basic class was an hour, intermediate was an hour and a half. Dan comes and teaches the last forty five minutes. So De Jerry would be teaching the Filipino arts, uh, you know, but Dan would teach everything. And you're okay. you're standing there, and I mean. Dan is throwing stuff out so quickly. But see, that was the way of how Dan teaches. Throw it out there. You see it? If you absorb it, use it. If not, just wait tomorrow. I'll give you something else. <laughs> that, yeah. that's, that, that's Dan, you know. And I, I can't knock that way because, you know, I, I did Taekwondo, Mudokwan, and Chungdokwan Taekwondo. And, uh -huh. you know, it, it was rigid. But see, I came from Kajin Kempo. And that's Hawaiian uh, Kempo from Imperado. Well, right. when you learn Kempo, Kempo was like a, a, a first stage of like JKD in a way because they, they do all kind of fighting. So okay. I came from a non-structured to a structured, and then I met Danny and Asano. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, did, did, people, did, did people use notebooks back then? Did everybody have a notebook? A notebook. Uh, the only guys that ever saw taking notes was Chris Kent, Jeff Amada, and there could have been a couple other guys. I never did mm -hmm. because the way I, I was I was trained was you cannot fight out of a book. Mm -hmm. So I said, if I've got the knowledge, I've got it. If I don't, mm -hmm. oh, well, I'll learn something else. Okay. I, okay. I, I did make notes. I have notes for when I teach my you know, teach teaching students. And right. You know, you know, as you get old, you, you, you forget things, so I make notes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and But other than that, I was never one to be a note taker. One of the reasons was my handwriting was with a crap. I was, remember, I was right-handed, and I couldn't write fast with the left hand. So okay. whenever I was working patrol, if I gave you a traffic ticket, it takes me like four or five minutes to write the damn ticket because I can't write fast. <laughs> right. Yeah. Note taker. 
So you just adapted. You just applied the JKD principle, didn't you? Yeah. 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 JKD yeah. was right on track mm -hmm. for what I I needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, great because mm -hmm. Dan is pouring stuff into your teacup, and you just whatever that residual is left, that's you. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I will say that yes, I did perfect the jab. I mean, uh, years ago, I trained a guy you know, Cameron Rico, on a yes. Saturday in uh, Frank Lovato. And I told them, I'm only going to use a jab. You throw any punch you want to throw. And Cameron was amazed, like I can tell you. I think I'm the guy that let the beast out of the cage because Cameron, Cameron Rico is a friggin' animal now. <laughs> I watch guys try to box him, and Cameron yeah. just eats them up. Yeah. I mean, I respect this this young guy. I can call him, you know, he's in his 50s now. But Cameron is a, an excellent fighter. I mean, his hands, he's tricky. He's sneaky. He he parries like I, I do the same thing. You know, you mm -hmm. have your hands up. I'll reach out and I'll slap your hand and I'll hit you with a cross. You know, but, you know he's smooth. He's yeah. smooth still. And he hits like a grizzly bear. He's amazing. Good. Amazing. Yeah, nice. Amazing. I'm proud of him. What, what he's got, <laughs> level he's at. It's amazing. Yeah, listen, um, it seems to me that back then, people didn't have any hang-ups about what they were learning, what it was called, whether there was Filipino martial art mixed in with it, uh, Muay Thai or, or whatever. So what, what do you think about the modern day, let's call it the modern day stuff, right? Where people are like, well, no, Jeet Kune Do is this versus Jeet Kune Do being that. I mean, it, 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 I mean, you probably uh, you probably don't get involved in all that, but I mean, you have an opinion on that stuff? Yes. Uh, to me, everybody that's doing this is people that came way after us, number one. Number two, they're, they're, they're trying to find something, trying to build something. They're trying to make Jeet Kune Do a style. Mm -hmm. It ain't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Jeet Kune Do will, will never be a style. I mean, because when you look at JKD, in my words, you should be a seeker of the truth. Um, whatever works for you, use it. Keep it simple. Don't make it difficult. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of guys, they're not going to, oh, no, because they want, they want the supernatural uh, martial arts, and they think that's JKD. JKD is not a martial art. JKD is the way of Bruce Lee, period. Right, right. Oh, no, no further. But what we learned, and as Dan said, you know, here, I give you all this information. Mm -hmm. If it works, use it. If it don't, come back tomorrow and we'll work on something else. But everybody wants to make it a style. It's never going to, it cannot be a style. I mean, yeah. our, our curriculum is always, you teach the basics. I mean, I may, now, if I, if I train you for 10 years, you're going to probably follow my footsteps. And I'm going to keep knocking you off the wall saying, don't follow me be you don't be mm -hmm. me and this is what these guys have to understand this concept you know they debate is this original is this is this the jkd concept well the concept is us guys that came after the chinatown school you know jerry poti was teaches original jkd but if you go when jerry was alive to his school don't be surprised to see a filipino stick come out or see something right. like muay thai Right. So that that is just it. I mean, you look at Chris Kent. Chris teaches everything, but Chris has one of the best understandings of JKD, and he would probably say it similar to what I'm saying. You know, because you're you're constantly modifying yourself. That's mm -hmm. JKD. The minute you stop modifying yourself and making different changes every day, you're no longer practicing the way of Jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. Simple. And that's yeah. the way. Keep it simple. Don't make it difficult. Don't argue about it. Don't bicker about it. You know, come right. on. Now. Roll over the in in keeping it simple, right? Is is paying attention to detail one of the aspects of keeping it simple? Pardon me now? Is paying attention to detail is that an is that one of the aspects of keeping it simple? Yeah, you know, when you start off, you, you have to have a foundation. You gotta mm -hmm. You have to build off of something. Mm -hmm. That's basic. The basics, like Jerry Bochy said, the basics will never leave you. Leave you. Now, you right. take 
Take the step and slide, for example. When we drill the step and slide, your foot is moving about six to eight inches. And then the rear foot does the same. Right. But I've been in the ring. When you get in the ring, you're not moving like that. Your steps now change to about one inch forward, one inch on the rear foot. Okay? Because mm -hmm. if you try to make that, you have to look at that time frame of taking an eight-inch step, you're going to get knocked on your can. If you get a guy that's super fast, he's going to deck you. So you, you kind of move short, boom, 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 you know, and you set them up. You don't right. have, you got all day to hit somebody. Take your time. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, I mean and it, it, it's so simple, but a lot of the guys, they, I, I see these guys doing footwork and I see their head going up and down when they move. Well, I hate to say it, guys, you're telegraphing and you don't know it. When I mm -hmm. see guys go across, they turn all the way back and wham. Why can't you throw across from here? Pow. Yeah. You know, like I tell guys, I have a thing I train. I hold a focus glove. Hit it with the jab. When you hit it with the jab, I take my hand and I, with the focus glove, and I hit before you can get it back. I get them every time. But they can't get me. I said, because you're focusing too much on the hit. If you go out a thousand miles an hour, get it back home within two thousand miles an hour. Yeah. But like Dan, you know, hit the heavy bag. Hit the heavy bag like it's a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Hit it. And right. Go. Right. Yeah. A lot of guys. Don't that have. that reminds me. That reminds me of two things that I heard two different people say. One was Paul Vunak, and the other one was Ted Wong. You know, and and, and I I think a funny thing is that. A lot of people think that there's a whole lot of difference between all the JKD people. But if, if you spend long enough, I think you end up realizing there's more similarity, there's more commonality than there is difference in all the JKD people, right? Yeah. But you got to spend long enough. See, the thing that, the thing that uh, well, guys, a lot of instructors have to realize is when you are showing something, they always show with a slow motion and they get to the karate stuff. The arm goes out and it stays there and then you do all these techniques. Right. You have to keep it in reality. You right. don't have like that in a fight. So mm -hmm. you, you show the stationary stuff to show where the hand is placed. But when you get an actual boxing, that ain't going to work. You're going to lose. You know, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's a, different, a different animal. Fighting and say you're training something is different. A guy is coming at you trying to take your head off your shoulders. You better be able to move. You better right. have a good foundation footwork. You know, right. because as I told you a while, well, a couple of weeks ago, to me, a fighter, analyze, intercept, penetrate, okay? Another side of the coin is timing, footwork, and patience. If you mm -hmm. don't have that, you're not a fighter. Mm -hmm. And some guys say, what does that mean? I just think about it. Now, Jerry Pote told me I was gifted. I said, me, gifted? He said, Dave, you have natural timing. He says, you're not the fastest guy in the class, but you have timing that makes you look like you're the fastest. We went to, uh, God, I think it was uh, UCLA years ago, and there was a guy that was the conditioning coach for the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, yeah. And they had a, a device that well, would board. Time, right. Yeah. A device that would time the speed of your punch. It goes through one light to another light. In fact, I was one of the slowest guys. You know, but Jerry Pochi says, Yeah, you're you're slow at that, but you got timing. You see something starting to come and bam, you get there first. But well, what did Bruce Lee always say? He says, Don't be a counter butcher. When you see it start to move, attack. And Dan mm -hmm. told me years ago, uh, Bruce, that was Bruce Lee. On the Filipino side, he said the Bruce Lee of the Philippines was Floro Villabreo. He was the same way like Bruce. He, right. he would see you starting to attack, and he would crash the line before you could finish executing. So mm -hmm. that, that's what you, you, you try to focus on in JKD. You yeah. know, that's, we don't focus on high kicks. <laughs> Cameron, Cameron, Cameron said earlier that you could never see your jab coming; that you would just feel it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got that gift now, because guys, yeah. I've watched him. Guys, yeah. 
see I've seen him annihilate people. Yeah, my my jab is very sneaky because I don't I don't telegraph. I'm even 73 years of age. Dan, I used to move a lot on my legs. Now I have arthritis in my right knee, so I can't move. But mm-hmm. I used to hit. And Dan told me when I was 28, he said, Dave, when you get older, you're gonna lose them legs. I said, oh, <laughs> not me, man. Right. I'm yeah. ready. And yeah. Dan, he would laugh at me. Dan was right. Uh, I was <laughs> in the ring at least I was 53 years of age. And when I got in my 50s, I found out it was harder to move. Uh-huh. Now, when I trained with Steve Martinez, I used to always think he was kicking my butt, right? And Steve, when he was 40, at his birthday party, said, Dave, when I boxed you, I was trying to survive. I was like, how do you figure that, man? You're an animal. Well, Steve taught me how to fight inside. I okay. thought fight with the jab. And when you combine okay. the two together, that's the, that's the gift. If I get right. inside, inside now, yeah, I can I can bust ribs. It's not a problem. Yeah. But you you will lose your you, – you probably know the same thing. The legs are not the same today as they were when I was in my 20s. No, I, I don't know yet because I, I, I got to wait until I turn 50. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Yeah. Listen, I, I want to ask you something, though. You just said something about in a fight, the guy's coming to tear your head off. How do you put that into the training? How do you how do you approach that attitude of in the training? Right. Because we've got to think about safety and what have you. But how do we put that emotion or that attitude into the training? The fighting after doing the training? Yes. The, the idea that the guy is coming to tear your head off, but we're training for that guy. In, in training, you're not going at 100% power. Okay. You are, you're hitting, but you're not, mm-hmm. to kill. you're not, you're not killing. You're hitting. Okay. And mm-hmm. good training partner like Chris Kent, Steve Martinez, good, excellent training partners. Uh, Cam and Rico, excellent training partners. Okay. Well, you are working on the finesse. Now, sometimes what you do, and I've done, I'll tell the student, okay, you will be throwing only a right cross. And ah. I'll throw the jab. So what you, you 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 break it down. And what I yeah. would do, if I know that you don't have a good right cross, I'm going to make you throw the right cross, and you can't throw no other bunches. Because, you know, the only time you throw a hook is if you're inside. I see these guys throwing these wide country hooks, you know, coming way out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Hey, guys, that's not reality. That's a guy that's scared throwing any kind of punch to keep you away. If you throw a hook like that on me, I'm going to eat you up and kill you. Uh, not not good. A good hook comes inside and you're not going to see it. A good uppercut, he's inside. You're not going to see it. You're just going to feel it. Right. But the jab is the key to fighting. The other side of the coin is a good shin kick. Now, the shin kick if you're in a fighting, if I can, I can't show you on this, but a good shin kick should just barely scoot across the floor, 12 inches, pop you in the shin, and the minute that shin kick kicks, like Jerry Pote showed me, he placed his his foot on my shin and he held his arm out and touched my forehead. He says, "You got the message, Dave?" I said, "Wow." He says, "If I can hit you with a shin kick, I can hit you with a or with a back fist." And I said, amazing. And these are the things that guys don't get. Guys, they study martial arts. They get into what they think they're doing, Jeet Kune Do. But mm-hmm. they are not, I say, being scientific to break it down to the mechanics of how it works. How mm-hmm. do you get from point A to point B? You know, a lot of guys, they, they miss it. A lot of guys are their instructors. And there's a lot of instructors out here that don't know how to fight. And I'm not right. talking about from us. I'm talking about the many styles. Now, you take, like, the Gracies. Remarkable. Remarkable. I've seen the Gracie family. I was there at their grand opening. Remarkable. They got JKD of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. That's what it is. They mm-hmm. don't do Jiu-Jitsu like they do in some other country. Right. You know, old man Gracie developed something that, that worked. You know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of our people have studied the Gracie with the Gracies. Dan said he with the Machados, the cousins of the Gracies. Mm-hmm. Dan made his black belt, what, 63 years of age? You know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and that, and, and see, the, the point is, learn everything you can grasp in your lifetime. Right. 
and put hey. put the philosophy of JKD in right. There it is. Yeah. So since you brought up the grappling, um, and you 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 mentioned Poteet, you mentioned Steve Martinez, all the guys you train with, everything, but you haven't said anything about Larry Hartzell. Oh God. Yes. I can't forget him. I remember when he came here from North Fork, Virginia, I think it was, and he brought uh, two guys with him, Dale and, and uh, Hal Faulkner. And uh, I didn't study uh, full bore with Larry, but Larry mm -hmm. did teach me some things that was very been very useful in law enforcement. Uh, I said, man, where'd you learn how to choke guys out like that? He says, I used to work in a psych ward. And <laughs> His job was to ch choke people out if the person was acting up. Right. But Larry, you know, Bruce Lee's student, I mean, the guy, um, he, when he was alive, shh, the guy was amazing. Strong as an ox. And his grappling was unreal. I mean, this great guy, great, great martial artist. And, and his, you know, anybody that said his, it was called JKD grappling because he, mm -hmm. he devised it. But right. he, was, he was just unreal. A cop, bodyguard, you name it. And yeah. big hearted, soft spoken guy. Right. What what's um what do you think is is like what are some of the great things that law enforcement people can take from JKD? Don't be in a set pattern because when you're out there in law enforcement and you grab a gang banger, because I worked on the gang task force and mm -hmm. I'm also a traffic a traffic specialist, so that means I'm stopping 30, 40 cars at a 10 hour shift. Right. I don't know when I pull a guy out of the car, I don't know what he knows or what he can do. And sometimes what they do, they'll get out of the car with gangbangers and they'll act like they're a wimp, but this guy is ready to take your head off at the first sight that he thinks he can get you. You don't know that. Right. So coming out of JKD, you you always expect something is gonna happen. Uh, I never would give a, a flat chest to somebody. I'm always pointing my shoulder, my hands always covering my chest. My other hand is on my gun, you know, right. and I'm always ready for the unexpected. I never tase anybody with a taser because I carry what they call a sap. It's a two pound piece of lead, about 12 inches long. Yeah. That's what I, I didn't carry the side handle baton. I carried the expandable baton. Right. I carried a big heavy flashlight. And me and my partner, my partner was a 50 degree black belt in Japanese judo. His brother was a judo champion of the sheriff's department. So with the two of us, I'm the guy that talks to smack. My partner goes around the back. If I say 1015, which means prisoner in custody, Eddie would hit him low and I hit him high. In three to five seconds, <laughs> you're, you're handcuffed. <laughs> you know, so we always, I, I was blessed for 25 years. I never got hurt in a, any fight. I, I, we, we won everything we did. We Any suspect we got, they went to jail. We went mm -hmm. home. So uh, using what I had learned in martial arts was uh, very helpful. Because, you know, I, I put, like, the Filipino martial arts in JKD, you got to put them in the same bowl because the way they fight with that stick, you put the stick right. down, you still 85% of the art. Right. You know, cool out, cool yeah. out, that's hands. You know. Yeah. And when you apply this all together, I mean, you're going to be at a level above the normal guy. Right. You just reminded me of of something. So I don't know if I could get this up here. I'm probably going to me mess it up. But you see this this photo sequence here. That's Guy Motto. With um, yeah. Yeah, Guy Motto. He devised the handcuff search technique with the finger lock. He devised that when he was working in the, in the jails. Him and Mickey Matsumoto. Mickey Matsumoto. Out of, G out of Jeet Kune Do. Yes. And Mickey Matsumoto was my partner's brother of judo. So they devised ah. And these these were the two smallest guys in the county jail, right? So they had a Samoan gangbanger one time. And when the gangbanger saw them coming to take him out of the cell, hey, man, please, don't let those guys beat me up. Two little guys. I <laughs> motto is one of my JKD brothers. He came after me. I'm his senior. But okay. he was fast as lightning. This guy could jump around like a little Mickey Mouse. I mean, he reminds you like like Dan, because Dan is fast. Dan's like putting a, a super mouse in a box 
and right. bring a cat around and watch how he jumps around. That, that was my model. So he devised right. a technique that is still used today, and it's used all over the USA. Amazing. Yeah. See, th I, I think that sometimes, and what you just said about Inasano and his speed, I think that there's just a lot of stuff that the new people, the younger people, they don't know about the contributions to Jeet Kune Do, do they? They don't have a clue. Yeah. It's guys like you that are putting the word out here so people can learn what has happened in history. You know, I hope they get to see and get to learn. But, you know, because Dan is like, say, Dan's 83 years of age. Uh, you right. know, Chris, yeah. Chris, I think Chris is in his 60s now. You know, so none of us, none of us are getting any younger. All of that, Jake, mm -hmm. everybody now is, uh, even Steve Martinez, Steve is, I think, 62. And he's also retired. Wow. Yeah, so every, everybody now is probably one of the youngest guys is Cameron Rico. <laughs> there, there's yeah. some guys that came after us that are also younger, but they came right at, well, though they, they, they got the JKD at the IMB Academy. I think Bud Thompson, as I recall, was one of the, the last group of JKD that graduated I, in, uh, from the College Academy. From the Academy, right, yeah, yeah. But, Bud is, is still teaching in his 90s. Or getting yeah. But, yeah, but actually, he, he was another one that, uh, I guess he couldn't make it, but he was another one that said to say hello to you. Yeah, we talk all the time. You know, Bud, uh, okay. for a short man, he got the longest arms you could ever see. <laughs> <laughs> he got arms like a freaking gorilla. I mean, they go all the way down to his yeah. ankles. Yeah. Strong. As yeah. Like, you, know, he's, you know, he's had both his shoulders messed up. But see, I remember I met Bud. Bud was probably in his 40s when uh, I, I was one of the guys that voted him in and uh, a very humble, dedicated individual. Mm -hmm. you know, and he, he's, also very, he's also one of my best friends. Um, and and he, he, was, he, was he everybody's drug supplier back when drugs were, a, you know, was a good word? Yeah, he, well, he supplied vitamins to Dan and Bruce Lee. Yeah. He had a store in Hollywood. And uh, he, yeah. he you, you named the vitamins, oh, God, this remarkable guy. Like I said, Bud is so humble, it's unreal. A good guy, though, hmm. really. And all of the students yeah. are very, you know, he, he, his students are just like him. Everybody's very nice, very humble. And, yeah. and you know, there's been a lot of great people, humble people that's come through Danny and Asano. Oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah. So you voted Bud into the JKD class? Yeah, I was voted Who? in. But who voted you in? Oh, God, it'd be Chris Kent, Hector Reed, Greg Shannon, um, Tim Watanabe, Jerry Pote, of course, because Jerry mm -hmm. Pote presented me with my, you know, they gave you a college stick, said JKD, which I still have. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, what, that night, Jerry called three guys out of the class. That was me, Jeff Amari, right. and Steve Martinez. Right. And Steve Martinez, right, yeah. It was, and we didn't even know what this thing was coming. Well, look, me? I didn't think I was good enough. You know, I mean, I had a bad right hand, you know. And they said, it's not about your quality of how good you are. It's a quality of you as a person. That's what Jerry told me. He said, they, they, look, at, they, they look at your personality, how you are. You, you don't have all the egos. And it was a good thing. Um, yeah. But, you know, after the college academy, the JED level was disbanded. And... Um, I guess I think because the, the guys weren't growing, it was like a good old boys club, you know, you right. know a boxing club. It started back up again at the IMB Academy, but it, okay. it, it wasn't the same as it was in the in 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79. It was different. Mm -hmm. It's way, way, mm -hmm. way, way, way different. Way different. Yeah. But like I said, so, a bunch of guys, you know, and I mean, I, I've seen Chris, Chris Kent go from a 20 year old to where he is today. Right. An excellent person that points the truth. He knows yeah. what he is. Whoever his students are, I hope they realize who they have as an instructor. And Cameron, and I, yeah, I think, think they, they do. do. So, yeah, they, yeah, I'm quite sure. Yeah. And Cameron, Cameron, Cameron has that group down on, uh, on the beach or something, right? Yeah. 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 Yep, and, he's, I like that. and he, he teaches them down there. And, you know, they, they're, they're fortunate. You know, I mean, I've had 
I've had some good guys. I had two guys I trained in the sheriff's department that took um, the sheriff uh, Olympics, and I only wow. had six. Weeks, I only had six weeks to train them. So mm-hmm. the sergeant said, "How did you teach these guys?" I I put in my bag and I broke out a rubber dagger. I said, that, "That's a simile like a knife." Yeah, I poked up their stomach with a dagger so they would they would block because most fighters, even professional fighters, they don't all protect the low line. That's something I always say. Right. You know, because okay. every time you hit somebody, where's he hit him? Right there in the gut. You know, mm-hmm. take the low line. So I did that, and uh, I told the guys, work the jab, work the cross. I'm not concerned about the uppercut and the hook because you're not that good. Stay at long range and just outpoint them. Don't try to go for a knockout. The guys won. Right. You know. Yeah. And it was fun teaching these guys. You know, I got a bunch of egotistic young deputies, and I'm an old man. That old guy is going to teach us? And I'm just laughing. Okay, well, <laughs> you all have to try to laugh. Get in the round with me. Good. You know, they respected me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been martial arts now over 50 years. Uh, best thing I ever did. I've just enjoyed it. And I feel very fortunate to gotten to train under uh, Danny and Asano and his crew. Yeah. You know, that great. It's perfect. Hey, I hope, um, what I hope is that everybody else after us keeps the movie, the movement going forward, and doesn't right. try to make it a style or a system. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, the the truth is the thing that 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 has to be put out there constantly. You know, so I, I think that um, as much as we can and as often as we can, where we see. Uh, the truth being distorted and sometimes even being obliterated, then we got to step up and say something or do something um, uh, about it. You know, um, when you were talking about people that people that train on the Inasano, do you know, um, you know, um, the name um, John McLean, not, not the yes, Bruce. I yes, I you do. know who I'm talking about? I know very well. John came to us as a young kid. He also worked with Michael Jackson, uh, a great guitarist or bass, whatever it was. He, I, I forget which one he played, but a young kid, humble. If he hit somebody at 16, 15, he would start to cry. Oh, I'm sorry that I hit you. I said, John, don't worry about it. Because the guy, he'll, he'll survive, you know. But uh, he was very dedicated. Uh, oh, man, I mean, the guy had a heart. I haven't seen John since he was probably 16, 17 years of age. I remember at 16, he was driving a Mercedes Benz. How did this kid afford this? He got his own recording studio. Well, the kid was playing with Michael Jackson. You know, yeah. I mean, the kid was, he was remarkable. And I tell you what, hands down, at 16, if this guy would have went into professional boxing, he would have been up on top. He would have been a champion. Right. He was yeah. good, very good. I very heard, nice. I, yeah, I heard, I heard that story um, from from Sifu Dan a, a long time ago. Yep. You know, so I, I wondered. So, so in '84, when the Kali Academy closed, right? So there was the IMB, and then there was Culver City, right? Yes. Uh huh. And you ended up at both places, right? Well, I didn't go to Culver City because Dan wasn't there that long, and I was teaching at the IMB. But when okay. Dan opened up uh, the Marina School, okay. I didn't help. He didn't have any instructors enough, so I went with them and I taught there. I taught there about I don't know about a year, year and a half, something like that. Mm-hmm. All right, now you got to tell me about this: the demo team with the percussionists. That How did me. that come up? Yeah, where did that come from? Uh, years ago. Dan could not hold the beat on the drum. <laughs> As you know, okay. And I told Dan, Dan, my percussion, I, you know, I, I've been playing on Congress since I was nine years old. Right. Good. Well, you can play for the demos. So uh, I was playing either on timbales, bongos, congas. And uh, when they had, the, when we do what they call the chain, right? I would come out behind the drums, Dan would beat, I'd go out there, I would do a little bit, then I'd get back on the drums again. Yeah. After yep. that, that, that came from me. Uh, I set up the rhythms, and now he's got just about like an orchestra at his, at his school, at his academy. I now. know, right? I know. But, but on drums. yeah, but they need some flavor. They need a little bit of flavor. 
<laughs> he still has a big, it's a gong bop conga. I got that for him at a, uh, at a swap, uh, not a swap, at a, uh, what is it, a uh, store. And uh, I said, Dan, here, this is a good drum. I went and got, got a new skin put on it. And mm -hmm. I tried for years to teach to get teach Dan the rhythm. But Dan starts <laughs> starts off with the rhythm, and then he gets excited, and he's watching the guys train, and right. he goes out the damn door. <laughs> so what I would do, I would play an offbeat to match his unorthodox offbeat style to make it sound. Uh -huh. And we did that yeah. Hawaii, Las Vegas, uh, we went to Sacramento, uh, there's a large Filipino community up, up north, and wherever we, where, you know, wherever we go, I just pack the drums up, okay, that's where you want me. Right. There, there was a, there was a, uh, another guy, I, I, um, it was his name Anton, and he was like a professional drummer or something? Anton, dear boy, was a friend of mine, and, um. I brought him along, and he sat in with us a couple of times. He was a martial artist, but he was a professional a Latin um, salsa oh. percussionist. Matter of fact, I, well, the way I met him, okay. he taught me, he trained me how to play tambales because I couldn't play the congas. Mm -hmm. I wanted something to help my right hand. And actually, yeah. the congas, yeah. my right hand used to be like this. Playing the congas straightened my hand out, and now I can use it. But I couldn't, I couldn't right. do that back then. So that's how I met him. Uh, oh gosh, nineteen, probably seventy four. I met Anthony. Okay. And then we uh, we trained, studied, you know, uh, music, you know, and that was uh, timbales. And then uh, I, see, I already knew how to play congas. I just couldn't get my hand to make the sound because my hand was messed up. But I could. Right. Play. So I yeah. used to. I used to put foam on the stick so I could hold it, you know, or tape it to my hand, and then mm -hmm. play, play the zabalis. There, there's a, there's another guy. You, you know the, the, the percussionist Alex Acuna? Do you know who that is? Oh, that guy. I don't know him personally, but I know who he is. He yeah. Is special, he is remarkable. So so apparently, I don't know if he still is, but he's an, he was, was at the Inosano Academy as yeah. well. Yeah, he was a student. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's funny. Inasano calls him Alex Kahuna. <laughs> yeah, he's a very, very great, great guy. I mean, you know, most you meet these Latino Latin percussionists, they're all uh, very good people. You're very humble, and uh, he's he's got I me. Mean, if you go onto YouTube, you can see him all over YouTube. Yeah, 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 all over YouTube. Yeah, I I um I remember once I got I kind of got in trouble because Inosano was here in Miami, and I wanted him to show the Villabril Largusa Numerata, and he was like, "We gotta have the drums. If we don't have the drums, you know, it, then you can't you can't really do it." Right? Yeah, see, I, when when we used to do demonstrations, I would be watching uh, Jeff Hamada, Chris Kent. Um, we had Joe Gee, and I, I'm watching these guys, it was Louis Zunega, and I'm watching these, and it's Benny Ortiz. So I'm watching these guys perform with their footwork. I would drum to their footwork. Yeah. And that's how the guys go, man, how did you do this? Well, I, I watch, it's like, when you have a dancers, you drum in Latin music, you drum to the dancers. Right. That's how I made it work. Right. But... But but wait, Dave Lear, you're not you're not Hispanic, aren't you're you're Caribbean, aren't you? Yeah, I'm a mixture of uh, I'm half white and then uh, Caribbean and with Hispanic Hispanic blood also. Ah, okay, so that explains it. Nine different nationalities. <laughs> <laughs> that that explains it, right? Um, my, my mother's family is from the West Indies. Okay. Okay. They, they 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 refer way back to probably uh, Jamaica, Cuba, and uh, Puerto Rico. All right, got it. Um, all right, so let me let me ask you this. Um, there was a time, and this is something that Chris Kent and I have have spoken about. There was a time when you could say Jeet Kune Do dominated the airwaves, the martial art airwaves. Now it doesn't. 
Is, is that just a normal thing or did something go wrong in Jeet Kune Do? What, what do you think? Well, you know, what I think happened is that people after us that studied uh, Jeet Kune Do, because I was shocked one time, I watched an MMA tournament and this guy said, oh, I represent Jeet Kune Do. And I said, oh, no. Here we go. He got his butt kicked. But everybody is in this fascination. There's so many guys that want to be Bruce Lee. I've seen guys wear the Bruce Lee type of shoes, the pants, the hairstyle. And I'm looking at these guys. We had a guy at the Filipino College, College Academy. I forget his name, but this guy, I, I gloved up with this guy one night, and he's jumping around making all these noises, whoop, 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 all this other bit. And I said, hey, guy, are you ready to box? I'm going to knock you on your can if you keep doing that. And I walked right through him. Mm-hmm. It's really funny because that, that sound, I think he copied that sound from Chris Kemp because Chris right. Kemp is the sound effects to the game of death. Yes. I know that. That was Chris right. Kemp. You know, yeah. but yeah. Uh, what happened today is that so many people are trying to define what they think Ji Kune Do is that hasn't been through the steps. And it's out of control. Um, we can't control it. I'm not going to worry about it. They're going to do what they want to do. They're going to say what they want to say. Uh, people have gone commercial with the word. And that's not what Bruce wanted. That's not what, like Linda Lee said about the book, The Dao Ji Kune Do. It's just mm-hmm. a Tear the papers out and clean your windows with it. Mm-hmm. Guys don't understand what that means. They don't have a clue. It's one man's notes. Look at his notes. Okay, now, that's his way. Go find your way. Right. That's the concept. They don't. The yeah. You, you, know, you know what? I, you just made me think of this. You see what it says here at the top of Inasano's book? Guidebook. A G- that's what the Tao is also. Thank you. <laughs> That's a guy. Just yeah. like, like, I don't call myself an instructor. I mean, if you were to ask Dan, Dan will tell you, I never cared for certificates. Dan gave me one. I don't even know where it is. But mm-hmm. I cared for the certificates. I, I did that in karate. And what did it do? What did, where did it get me? You know, now, I don't, I don't need certificates. I just right. be myself. If I can right. pay, Dan told me, if you can pass on the knowledge, you have it. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. I, I pass it on. Bingo. I don't tell people that I train, you don't, if you don't like it, you, like my son. My son is a great Shi Jiu-Jitsu. He's a blue belt. You know, that's what he wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But he also wants to learn what I do because he right. found out you got to learn how to close the gap. Yeah. And you can't just do it thinking the other guy is going to stand and let you grab him. You know, I had I had a student that was a brown belt in the jiu-jitsu, Gracie. And he said, if you can beat me, you can train me. I said, not a problem. I beat him when I said the word, not a problem. It got to his brain. And when we got onto that, he was scared to charge me. And when he did, I flattened him. You know, he said, no one's ever decked me like that. I said, well, you came out as Superman, mm-hmm. and I'm Kryptonite. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. He yeah. yeah. was, was a young kid, and he trained yeah. me. But uh, you know, guys just have to under- they, they, they have to get an understanding of stop trying to make it something that it that it isn't. It's not a style. It's not even a mar- it's not even a martial art. It's just the guide. It's the way of Bruce Lee. Now we should go and learn to ourselves to do what one man did and follow that path. Jeet Kune Do, like Dan said, you don't apply it just to martial arts. It's a way of life. You can apply it right. to everything in your in your life. Right. You can be a race car driver. You can apply it to there. Look, look what happened with Dallas Cowboys. You know, what, three years mm-hmm. in a row, their mm-hmm. line was this unreal because of Danny and Asano and his crew. Yeah. You know, Dan, yeah. Chris, Jim Tackett, uh, Cass Magna, they all mm-hmm. went down there and they worked with their team. And, and these guys, this was unreal. Yeah. And none, of our, none of our guys were big as these football players, but they learned to adapt. And, and then they brought, and then they brought Chai and the Thai boxing. Yeah. 
Yep. Right? Yep. I, I, I've got to work. I mean, I never trained with, with, with Chai, but I worked with uh, Neil. Mm -hmm. A guy named Lot in the firm. He died. But uh, Muay Thai has a lot to offer. Yeah. But here's the thing. You get out there in the street, you're standing on the asphalt, and there's sand all over the ground. <laughs> you ain't doing no Muay Thai because you'll fall on your butt. Yeah. They, and that's what guys have to understand. What you may do in the ring on the pad doesn't work in the street. Now, I, I can say that from working patrol. We have right. the tactics. And I used to tell the defensive tactics to instructors, that ain't going to work out there in the streets, guys. They got a book that's about four inches thick. It ain't going to work. You know, you, you, you know, you can't work in a set situation. You got to be able to flow into A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Mm -hmm. You know, if mm -hmm. it's structured, that's the problem. The structure is, yeah. the structure is a learning tool. But once you get that message, get away from it. And now, like I said, it goes right back to make it your own. Yeah. But, so now, not nowadays, right? I don't know if you've heard this, but nowadays there's this idea that Jun Fan is the art and Jeet Kune Do is the philosophy. Yes, that's true. Yeah? Yeah, because see, Jun Fan was, of course, Bruce Lane, but it was Jun Fan uh, Kung Fu. Mm -hmm. So that was that. Because see, years ago, you were not supposed to publicize Jeet Kune Do to be the title on your school. Right. You'd say Jun Fan, but not right. Jeet Kune Do. Right. But everybody has Jeet Kune Do in their school. It's all over America, all over the world. Mm -hmm. It's it's you can't stop it. It's a train that you can't stop. You know, I mean, if anybody is going to use would use the name, I would say it's it should be, it should be Danny Anasano or Chris Kent, someone that's walked the walk. But yeah. there's not that many people out there that I feel should be publicizing the name G Kundo. Okay. okay. I, I, um, I right. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I do because it's important to me that the name live on. <laughs> like, like I tell my kids, this is JKD. Yeah. You know, and I don't have a school. I don't want a school. I'll come and assist somebody else's school. I just mm -hmm. don't the time, the interest to have a school. I mm -hmm. love working on an individual basis. You know, I, that's just my that's just my thing. Yeah. You know, have a school, you got to do what you got to do to survive. Somebody's right. Gotta, somebody's got to pay the bills. Yep. Hey, listen, what about Ted Wong? Did you have any interactions with Ted Wong? Ted Wong? Yeah. When he was alive, yes. Okay. Okay. Very knowledgeable. Uh, Ted Wong and Jerry Pote, I'd put probably in the same boat. That mm. is, they taught the way they were taught from Bruce Lee. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Jerry was, when he was around Dan, he was learning a lot of this other stuff that Dan was doing. Right, yeah. Because Dan, Dan explores the whole world, the universe, which, which is great. That's what it should, that's mm -hmm. what a person should do. But but Ted was uh, he's you know he was one of the originals. He's up there. He's on the top part of the pyramid. You know Dan Ted Wong Taki Kimura. You know yeah. I mean Danny Danny Lee. You know yeah you know, I met I met all I met them. I mean I, I was around Ted Wong not a hell of a lot, but okay. enough that he I knew him and he knew me. Right. Yeah. You know, but very yeah. very very knowledgeable. You know very nice guy. Very knowledgeable. And then Danny Lee was another one. And Danny Lee told me that uh, many years ago, he hit Bruce and Bruce broke his jaw afterwards. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah. He said, yeah. And he, he was a champion boxer, Danny right. Lee. Right, yeah, exactly. And he said, yeah, yeah, man. He hit Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee came out like a grizzly bear, like a tiger grizzly bear combination. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I wish I could have met Bruce, but it didn't happen. You know, I was a, a year too late. But what what about um what what about back at the uh, at the Kali Academy? Because I heard that that a lot of a lot of like the well known mainstream martial art guys would visit the Kali Academy. So 
you know, you know I mean, I, I don't know if it was people like Chuck Norris or Joe Lewis or, you know, you, you know, any, any of those guys, but, Not but I, Joe Lewis, but there was a, uh, I would call way back. Uh, Dan had me spar a guy and I knew enough that the redhead guy, or white guy. And he was uh, the West coast kickboxing champion. I didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. and, hey Dave, why don't you work out with this guy? Okay. I worked out with the guy, you know, the guy had good kicks, but you know, I, I, I kept my jab in his face so he couldn't kick me because the guy kicked like a mule. At right. the end, I said, man, your your hand is like a hatchet. I said, yeah, you're, you're like, a, like a mule. He said, yeah, but I couldn't get into you because you jab. You know, because he, he said he just didn't have a jab like that. But we had different people would come by at times. I never knew who they were sometimes, you know, but uh, you'd have people from all over the world that come by just to, to meet Danny and his You know, right. and Sometimes we may know who they are, and sometimes you don't. I mean, there was people, there was a guy, uh, what was his name? He came from France, uh, Dan Dubé. So uh -huh. Yeah. He came from France. And then, of course, you have the Penn Jots, a lot of people, Paul Detroit. Mm -hmm. I mean, all these people just would pop up. Dan is like a magnet. People just, just come right on in. I mean, he's, he's so magnetic. You know, it's just it's amazing. But people come to meet Dan. There's been Filipino instructors, you know, grand masters. They come to see Dan. If it wasn't for Danny and Asano, the Filipino arts would not flourish to where they are today. Right. Dan brought them all together. These guys didn't even talk to each other. Dan brought them all together. It was Dan yeah. and Johnny Lacosta. Johnny Lacosta, they all respected Johnny Lacosta. And uh, I think. Johnny Lacosta may have been one of the first persons that Dan was really close to. And then, of course, the Lukai Lukai, you know, Ted's dad, mm -hmm. Lucky Lukai Lukai. You yeah. know, he, he's attached with the Villa Braille part of uh, that chain. But uh, just amazing. All these people just came and always be coming to the... I didn't see him come to IMB Academy, but I did at, at the College Academy. Oh, my gosh. People from all over the world to, just to see Danny and Osama. Right. Um, would you say, in terms of Jeet Kune Do flourishing, let's call it, right? Is that due to him as well? well or I, is that just, or is that just due to Bruce Lee's reputation? Well, I think a little bit of both. I think um, Bruce Lee. It's one part people want to know more about Bruce, and then they know they can learn they would learn learn it through Dan, and then they want to learn about Danny and Asano. You know, yeah. I mean, the man Bruce chose Dan because he was a history teacher. He was a professional teacher about twenty something years, mm -hmm. and Bruce chose him to carry the torch, and that's where we are today. Right, Dan is the man that carried the torch. And that, that, that torch of knowledge has gone around the whole world. That's interesting, you know, because you just said that Bruce Lee chose Dan Inosano because Inosano was a history teacher. Cass Magda says because Dan Inosano is or was a PE teacher, that that's how a lot of the training methods developed as well, huh? Yeah, he was PE in history. Right. Yeah. Because Dan yeah. Dan taught me about the Filipino history. Matter of fact, I think Dan even gave, he gave me a book on Filipino history. Mm -hmm. That's where I learned. I've, I've had Filipino students that said, you know more about our culture than I do. <laughs> That's why they call me Lapu Lapu. There you go. <laughs> but I said, you know, Dan is, you know, when Dan lived, uh, I guess it was right near Harbor City, near the academy. His living room, I think, was three or four rows of books. Right. Yeah. And I don't know where he got them now, probably in his house, where he lives in now, but he had one room. That, it was like, no furniture, just a library of books. You know, and the man is just, like I said, he's walking knowledge. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it'd be really something if there had ever been the time for someone that could sit down and just take all of this man's knowledge and put it into an encyclopedia. 
of Danny and Asano because there's a lot there. Yeah. I mean, the way you, you look at how Dan teaches, Dan does not have to write a script. He can walk into a class anywhere in the world and start teaching. Right. right. Yeah. When we did our demonstrations back there was an example of Danny and Asano. We never practiced for a demo. Right. We mm -hmm. just did it. Hey, you mm -hmm. can me. I was at me and Jeff Amato went with Dan to uh, LA City College one year. Dan grabs the bolo and I have the spear. And Jeff, I think Jeff was beating on my timbali drums. And Dan is coming at me and I'm saying, oh my God. Because when, you know, when Dan starts off, Dan, he gets fired. <laughs> <laughs> he gets on drugs. I mean, yeah. Gets, wow. Yeah. And I'm with all yeah. my eyes. And he had, he had had these plugs in his head for transplant to grow his hair and blood starts coming out. And I said, Dan, you're bleeding. He said, it's okay, man. Dave, it's okay. It makes it look real. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> He's 10 degrees outside, man. I'm just trying to hide. And he, yeah. he come in with the blade. I got the spear. And I said, oh, my God. What, what am I going to do here? And, you know, because Dan, Dan, Dan is not slow. Even to this day, 83 years mm -hmm. of age, Dan still ain't mm -hmm. slow. He has, he has not slowed down to me at all. I mean, he is still, he may show things slower. But right. you get him fired up, shh. Yeah. It was in his thirties. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I, I saw I, I remember the first time I saw a video of uh Floral Villabril and he was he was moving and then for like ten seconds he went on fire. You yeah. know? And he was no longer that age. And I remember I saw that and I go, Holy crap, that's what Inosano does. The same thing happens to Inazano. Well, two guys that probably absorb more punishment would be from Dan would be Chris Kent and Jeff Amato. Because Dan would always demo on them. Luckily, I was smart and I stayed on the drums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I said, I do her safe to if I'm If I'm beating on them skins, I'm not getting my butt kicked out there. But right. I, I mean, this remarkable yeah hey there was the, there's this one I, I i know i think i have the the video it's it's on vhs of course but there was this one demo and you were talking about coming out from behind the drums so i, I mean i'm not going to expect you to to remember it but i remember you came out and you had like the largomano stick yeah. you're probably not going to remember that but I was wondering if that was like a favorite of yours or something. I like the long range weapon. Okay. Because I I, uh, I studied the Logomano style. And okay. I, I, I took I, I took a liking to it. You know, Dan showed me. I uh, I was assistant I assistant instructor to uh, Greg Lantial of the Villabrio family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just happened, you know, when Dan taught it taught it, I I, I liked it. I adapted to the long range stick. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm good with the short range stick, the dagger. It doesn't matter what I put in my hand. I right. adapt, but I like that long range stick. I like the, the theory of, of how it works. It's, and it's very useful in law enforcement. So a guy comes in with a knife. Yeah. Because, you know, if I shoot somebody with a gun, I'm going to get sued. But if right. I put his arm with a stick and yeah. he got a knife, I'm not going to get sued. So yeah. I adapt to Largo Mono. It was, it was very, uh, very, you know, very, very good to use. Was, was, is 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 that connected to your use of the jab as well? Uh, not you know in a way yes because you know I would when I when I hold the stick I would fake with the hand like you know so mm -hmm. coming back to the body I was fake and then the stick would come out you know so mm -hmm. the guy does not really know we you know, like Abba Nico the guy doesn't know are he's he with his hand or is he with his with the stick. You know, mm -hmm. and my theory is never let your opponent know when or what you're going to hit him with. Just right. hit him. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. But yeah. I, there's a lot of demos that uh, I come up from behind the drums in Chinatown. Um, oh, gosh. I probably did the same thing. We went to Kauai and Hawaii. We performed for Villa Braille. 
but different times I would come out and maybe we didn't have as big a demo team and I would, I would come out and, uh, and do that. Mm-hmm. Whenever they you know, they did, when they did, when they did the chain. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was good times, huh? Huh? It was oh, good yeah. times, huh? Yeah. You talk about fun. Oh my God. I mean, this just remarkable. Then we'd go out and eat Chinese food at the end, dance. Right. Hey, okay. And when Bud Thompson would be sitting next to Dan, he would grab Dan's hand and hold it down or stuff his wallet back in the shirt and we would pay. And Dan yeah. would go, guys, uh, I'll take it. We said, no, Dan, no, no, no. Because, you know, when you got into the JKD class, Dan did not charge us to train anymore. Right. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't pay dues. So we would not let, we would not let Dan pay. We, we would pay. Yeah. And then there, there was, there was, there was also at the end of the class on Tuesdays and Thursdays, back to the restaurant right oh yeah oh yeah 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 we used to in fact there was one spot we used to go to the gardena bowl in gardena and they were open 24 hours around the clock and we would go there and meet up go there and eat yeah and all yeah. all demos we ate after every demo no matter where we were at we'd go damn it's time to go out and have, have you know have a meal have the feast so you would do it again, huh? Yeah, it was, it, you know, those days I really miss. You yeah. know, and, you know, being around a network, a team of guys like right. that. Everybody was humble, right. sharing. You know, and that's what I wish everybody would, would would understand and see. Share your knowledge. Don't hog your knowledge. If you have a school, if you're an instructor at a school, and you're charging, fine. But don't hold back, because if you cannot pass it on, you don't have it. You know, if you can't pass on the knowledge, you don't understand it. And the right, way sir. it's going to flourish, you got to keep passing it on. Yeah. All like right. Dan planted the seed, that we got to carry it on. Got it. Okay. On that note, Davis Lear, it's been my great pleasure talking to you, man. Not a problem. I'm glad... I'm glad we were, we, I mean, you know, we tried to put this together many times before, but I'm yeah. glad, <laughs> I'm glad we were able to pull it off. And, um, you know, anytime you want to come back on, you just, you just, you know how to get in touch with me and we'll do yeah, it. Is that my phone number? The, yeah. Oh yeah. Cause there, there, there's yeah. a lot more we can talk about. I'm sure. Any way I can ever help or you need something or just, Hey, give me a holler. I will, sir. And people can find you on, on Facebook, right? Davis Lear. That's the easiest way I'm on, to find you. I'm on Facebook. Yeah. I'm easy to find. All right. Or, you know, cool. They, they, I mean, anybody can have my phone number. It doesn't matter to me. All right. You know, they could All right, man. Email me, whatever. Not a problem. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again. I'll talk to you again soon. All right. All right. Take care. Okay, man. man. Take care. Have a good one. All righty. Take that by itself, or you can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What's interesting about this, when you start to crisscross it, it will give you 64 variables. And 64 variables will expand to 128. You don't need your 128. You need one. It's like having 128 cars. You can only drive one anyway. Right? Judo, how many throws you learn? 67 throws in judo? What's a competitor do? Three. Three to five. That's it. You don't get those three and five, he's probably throwing you. Right? Agreed? Look how many locks we learned. Shoot wrestling, we learn 157 locks. Unless you're Eric Paulson, most of us only use three to eight. That's it. And you gotta use, and then sometimes that doesn't even work. Right? So, over here, what we're gonna do is just start with the backhand, 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 backhand. It's just like you start with the form, but it curves like that. So you start with the form, curve like that. That's your backhand, backhand. So if you go slow, so you don't hit each other's hand. Right now, we're matching hands, which in reality, you're not gonna match hands. I want to get you the basic 